First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Helen for that introduction. And also I'd like to express my gratitude to uh, James, who <coughs> gave me the topic to talk on, which was changing uh, China's changing uh, urban communities, which was a chance for me to sort of like think about some of the work I did on a book, uh, similarly titled, uh, but also to go beyond that and to sort of speculate a little bit more about what was going on in China. Uh, tonight I'm going to go through a talk that will begin with a sort of basic review, if you like, of concepts of community in China, going back to ancient times. Then look quickly at some of the contemporary examples that came out of a <coughs> long field research I was involved with. Then talk about um, the kind of uh, uh, basic template that has been operating in China for some period of time and also talk about some of the problems associated with that, and then to look at um, the kind of new normal, as they call it in China these days, and what that might mean uh, in general terms. And then finally, um, talk about several strategies that have begun to emerge from some of the major um, controlling agencies in China, which is likely to change the manner in which the urban landscape of China is being uh, made. In fact, in this first phase, they refer to China as being in a sort of first draft, which I find astonishing when you're building about 130 million housing, but anyway, that's the way it is. Um, communities in China, of course, have uh, a, a long and venerable history. It dates back, in this particular case, to the Shang Dynasty, which is around 1600 to 1000 BC, very old, based on the uh, clan lineage of the Zhu. Um, it was, of course, uh, there's one of the images on the right-hand side, it was, of course, um, agricultural community where the central demands uh, was where um, uh, crops were raised in order to pray the appropriate tith or tithe uh, to the kingly uh, uh, rulers of, of, the, of the Shang. Um, on, the, on the left, I'm really talking about, um, in the Western Ecumen, of course, we have lots of concepts of, um, of community physical ones, like for example Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities, uh, but when we could talk about it in the West we tend to talk about it more in sociological terms, and here we, we would be mentioning of course the, the work of the Chicago School um, amongst others. It's interesting because the sociological interpretation of China, in China of community, really only dates from about 1933, more or less commensurate with Clarence Perry's idea of communities built around schools, which you see an image of here, and it uh, was, was first enunciated in China by uh, Fei, uh, Fei Xitiang, um, who was at uh, Beida and who was working on this kind of scheme. Then later on, um, we come across um, later, later than the Shang, I should say, or to, towards the end of that sort of regime, we come across the kind of Li Ying Xiang uh, arrangement of um, groups, um, household groups, um, nested into um, uh, hamlets, and then the hamlets nested further up into, into villages. And in many cases, the village was also surrounded by a wall, it was enclosed, and had at its centre um, a lot of non-residential functions that we, we would typically associate with that kind of arrangement. Subsequently, we move into the, the concept of the Lin Bao Li Feng configuration, uh, where you have a Lin with a small, relatively small number of families, then you have the Bao, which is five times the Bao, the Lin, and then you have the Li, which is five times the Bao, and so it moves up again in this hierarchical kind of nested fashion to the, to the level of the, of the Feng, or the kind of ward uh, as a basis. Uh, this is fairly characteristic of medieval um, China. For example, this one's more or less drawn from the Tang Dynasty. Then when we move further on to the Baojia system um, of the Song, let's say, Song Dynasty, around about 1112 uh, AD, 1200 AD, we're talking about 10 households to a Bao, 10 Baos to a Jia, again nested in a sort of hierarchical fashion, often with a kind of militaristic orientation, so it was a lot about order and control, and also meant a kind of set, relatively cellular arrangement within a, a broader landscape of a, of, of a city and arrangements into the wards, the so-called feng. Then we come encounter um, during the late imperial period, let's say the Ming and the Qing of China, a kind of multi-layered arrangement, a subdivision into wards. Uh, what you're seeing in the image here 
In the center is the Chaolong map of Beijing from 1735, which depicts fairly clearly this sort of division into the, into the various banners, which are the militaristically inclined uh, groups of the Manchus who settled in the, um, in, in the, in the city of, of Beijing and of course served the, the, the Manchu uh, emperor. Um, streets, by the way, are very wide, as you can sort of see here, uh, but they are not to be confused with roads or some sort of means of egress. They were much more to do with parentheses between the banners so that they didn't come to grips with each other uh, un unnecessarily. And of course, operating entirely in the image on the far, far right is, is the, the idea of self-similarity where, you know, the, 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 <coughs> the pavilion is to the court, the court is to the suche one, the suche one is to the, to the block, and so it goes up in a kind of self-similar uh, way. Again, a little bit like the hierarchical nested aspect of community. Then when we move forward in time to the Republicans, the period from 1911 after the Xinhai Rebellion uh, brought the Qing down to 1949 when the People's Republic was formed, we encountered the Jia Bao Zhen Xiang uh, arrangement, which fostered a self-government at a fairly local level, at least that was the intention, uh, with an emphasis on community welfare, but also on security functions. They were very self-conscious um, uh, about that. And again, it was nested and hierarchical in its arrangement. Then moving further forward into the Dunway system of the People's Republic of China, which was modeled initially anyway on the Soviet model um, um, uh, uh, as, a, as a work unit. So it's sort of self-contained based on the micro rayon of the, of the Russians. Uh, in which you lived in communities, but those communities also had factories and uh, community services and, and so on, serving that particular unit. Again, it was hierarchical, and if you're looking at this particular image, you're going from top to bottom. The top was referred to as um, four dishes in, and one soup. In other words, the residential communities around the soup, which was in fact the, the kindergarten, the schools, and so forth, that formed the kind of heart uh, of the community. And then it scales up, uh, all the way through to um, really a city within a city, in this, in this particular case, Xiaosheng in uh, Shanghai, which ended up uh, in the 1980s. It began in 1950 with um, something like 110,000 people, uh, which is fairly large. Uh, an example of that in materialization is, is, is this project. It, it, it's the Chang'an um, uh, number one automobile factory complex in Manchuria. And this was very much modeled on the, uh, on the idea of the Soviet kvartal. Kvartal in Russian really means just a block, but it was a perimeter block arrangement, as you can see from the sorts of plans here. And also modeled on the Sotskorod, which simply means socialist city, um, uh, uh, as this kind of arrangement of these combinations of these particular units to build up to a, to a substantially uh, size city, but one that was fairly well planned. Um, Planner Konifkaria and uh, Planner Kovova were the two sort of doctrines. You had the social science, people came up with the program, they then had handed it off to the physical planners who came up with the plan. Debates, of course, during the PRC also came about between the Soviet referred model of the Kvartal, the perimeter block, and the Zeilenbau, which really, really derives, and by the way, not from Kabuzier, it derives from the sort of German heritage um, of people like Volta Gorpius, for example, um, uh, which are the slab, slab blocks. And in fact, this was decided around about 56, 57 in favor of the parallel blocks on the basis of sort of less isolation, um, more equitable um, access to resources. And I happen to think personally because it was much less bourgeois than the idea of this sort of enclosed compound, which I think uh, many of the Chinese officials anyway saw very much associated to a Europe of, um, uh, shall we say, kingly <laughs> operations, not one which was a, a people's republic. The level of units, um, again, the Soviets were very influential in the molding of these slab blocks. By the way, they were standard units no matter where you were in China. And believe me, China's a very big country, right? And it goes from circumstances in Manchuria, which are fairly inclement, all the way down to hot and sweaty areas in, in, in the south. Um, so it's a bit daft, I think, for us to think in this day and age that you have a standard unit everywhere. But that persisted until 1959. Um, and I'm showing you some examples on the left-hand side of that. <clears throat> 
the Chinese finally broke with the Soviets um, over the use of corridors. They had a lot of central corridors, uh, which the Chinese gave up very, very quickly. And that break occurred in the 1950s. And these were sort of um, uh, multi-rise multi uh, configurations, around about five, in most cases, seven stories tall, walk-ups, we would call them, I think, today. As far as high-rise was concerned, uh, it, with the exception of Shanghai, which, by the way, had a, almost as many high-rises in the 30s as New York City and Chicago, um, but leaving that out, out as an outlier, um, the first high-rise buildings during the People's Republic uh, came with the Tiananmen, Tiananmen um, uh, pro project in Beijing, the Three Gates uh, project, which was this long strip along um, almost where the former wall was, and uh, 1973. And then in 1976, the North Chao Xi Road project in um, uh, Shanghai. However, these turned out to be too expensive for proliferation. The elevators didn't work and it was terribly difficult to fix them. And so for technological reasons, they were sort of abandoned and never made a re-entry into uh, China until probably the 80s really in any uh, considerable number. Moving forward with the, the main plot here, the contemporary Shi Chu um, was promulgated by the Ministry of Civil Affairs in the 1980s to take up the slack that were, uh, particularly with respect to community services that uh, was vacated with the, the downgrading and down, uh, the, the loss of the Dunway of the work units and uh, to replace that with a kind of service, service provision. And here you see um, a Shi Chu arrangement with a sort of various neighborhoods within it in Taochong in, um, in Beijing, to the north of Beijing. It's got a population of something like uh, 150, 200,000. So it's on the, on the scale of the uh, <coughs> Shanghai example I showed earlier. Then, of course, we had traditional arrangements. Um, uh, in this case, I'm showing you the Lilong of Shanghai, um, which were very numerous, the lane housing of Shanghai. We could say the same thing of the Hutong, probably, of, 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 of Beijing. And I say they were very numerous because um, uh, <coughs> in the late, by the end of the late 30s, or the war of uh, resistance against Japan, there were something like 300,000 of these in Shanghai. So virtually everybody, if you do the arithmetic, you know, five person per family, it's about 1.5 1, 1 to 2 million people lived in this particular arrangement, which has shop houses along the uh, street, the top of that particular image, and of course with the Shukaman gates leading into the lanes. You can see an illustration of that. And the lanes laid out in grid forms or fish bones or, or some sort of arrangement like that. So to sort of summarize this, this very brief um, and rather casual history, uh, we're talking about communities which had a very strong spatial association um, and, and kind of were, were very distinct from a spatial point of view and an enclosed, shall we say, community. They were also often enclosed, that is to say, definitely bordered with gates and, 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 and uh, what have you. And they arranged themselves with each other as you raised in scale in a nested hierarchical fashion, almost without, uh, without uh, exception. Now, um, that's not to say everything was hunky-dory and benign and what have you, because it certainly wasn't. There was a lot of uh, collective compliance being forced on people. There was a lot of mutual surveillance and even coercion as, part of the, as a part of these sorts of arraignments. They were very much about control as much as anything else. Now, switching gears a little bit, um, this is a survey that um, uh, was one of the backbones of the, of the book that uh, James mentioned that I did with my Australian colleague Anne Forsyth um, and my postdoc, uh, Haya Khan. Um, and we went out and surveyed a bunch of communities, and I'm showing you four of them here, uh, Shanghai, Beijing, Suzhou, uh, and Shenzhen. And we picked sites which were sometimes in the center of things, sometimes on the periphery in order to get something of a general sampling. We were largely interested, at least I was, in middle class Chinese uh, way people lived uh, because uh, there didn't seem to be a lot of data about that. And uh, we did this work uh, in uh, conjunction with the School of Public Health under the so-called HAPPY, Health and Places, that's what HAPPY stands for, uh, initiative uh, as a sort of support um, um, of, of this. Now, these projects, of course, were built in the, for the most part in the contemporary era, although not entirely. Uh, 
Uh, and they took place um, in an unfolding of, uh, after the 1978 reforms and so forth, under a kind of three-phase strategy in China. Um, the first stage, of course, was to shift from um, housing as a welfare good, like under the Dunway system, into something you could buy and trade, marketization. The most successful program for doing that was probably the three-thirds project, where one-third came from outside your, under your mattress or outside your bank account, another third came from the Dunway that you were working for, and another third came from the district that you were working within. So it was a third, third, third as far as the financial mechanism was concerned, and it proved to be fairly fairly uh, popular and fairly, fairly successful. As time moved on, certainly into the 80s, um, we get into a second stage which, ha which had to do with opening up the markets further, make it a little bit more sophisticated. And then, of course, into the, <laughs> the stage with housing that most nations run into where you have to deal with the negative externalities of the, of the animal that you've unleashed, the commodifying animal you've unleashed, particularly with respect to affordability, affordability gaps, environmental performance, uh, and of course, stemming speculation, which in fact uh, China has been going through and really still is involved in. It also took place against a background um, of urban trends where you had a proliferation of cities. On the top, we can see 1950. You can see that China didn't have very many cities of any scale or size. Um, it had, and 17% of the population in 1950 was urban or classified as urban, living in a city. Now it's around about 50%, depending on how you want to count it. Uh, now we have about 670 designated cities in, in China. So it's a, a very rapid change in those sets of circumstances, which of course drives the, the, the community development engine considerably. The other aspect of it too is that um, uh, demographically, China is aging very quickly, particularly under the uh, influence of the one child, one family uh, policies. And they, uh, <coughs> uh, a bit like Japan moving into a stage where um, they're going to be considerably older than they are now, and of course all of the social security and workforce uh, aspects of that, and so-called income dividends and what have you, will sort of fall away. Other trends in play, which I think are of interest, uh, livable space standards have gone up considerably, you know, almost at a 45 degree angle. The age of housing stock uh, has also uh, decreased. Um, I think you might be surprised if I told you that in 2010, 43% of all housing was less than 10 years old. And of course, this, um, uh, <laughs> this is a big, a big amount of uh, big boom, boom for housing. Then thirdly, you have a, a, a retreat um, uh, on the government's part on the provision of uh, economic and suitable housing, which was then and now is being taken up at the municipal level to the extent that it is being taken up. And of course, finally, on the bottom right, you have these huge disparities between the tier costs of uh, uh, housing between, let's say, the tier one and tier two cities and those that are further down in the, in the hierarchy. In tier one, tier two cities, I'm thinking Shanghai, Beijing, we're talking about probably 15 to 18 salaries, um, uh, which is considerable. I mean, in the United States, my country, it's about four, maybe. Uh, just to give you a sort of a benchmark for that. Then looking at physically the characteristics of some of these communities, I've just picked two for this particular talk. Uh, this is Sun Linwen, which was built in 1994, was designed by the Tongji uh, Institute. Um, you probably know this, but many of the universities have their own kind of firm, so to speak, which they refer to as the Institute that does work uh, for them. It's um, a 13.8 hectare site. It's one big mega plot, as you can see. Uh, 2,000 dwelling units, about 7,000 people live there. It's under the auspices of the Shanghai Municipal Government as far as its um, administration is concerned. And the cost was around about 25,000 Y per square meter, which means um, we're talking about um, a unit that's probably on the order of what? $350,000, so it's not, not exactly cheap. Um, the megaplot cons uh, configuration is uh, uh, surrounded by these large roads. In this particular case, it's quite near to transit. Um, and uh, uh, the interior circulation, as you can sort of see from the plan, uh, is also there, although it's not exactly supposed to be, uh, it's more of a pedestrian environment than it is one for cars. Uh, 
This is an overall image uh, which shows the community facilities located at the centre and up, up on the bottom, on the top right of this, you can sort of see some of the office buildings that were built. So it was a kind of a work-live um, arrangement. There were schools on sites, kindergartens on sites and so forth. So it was echoing in many ways the kind of done way, although it's classified and built as a residential district. One of the things we're interested in is the sort of environmental performance, two aspects of this that we uh, modelled. Uh, one had to do with the thermal comfort in winter and summer um, within the, um, the, the, the area itself. R realize we're working with you know, epidemiologists and people who are worried about health. And of course, walkability, which again is a health-related uh, aspect. And in these regards, um, Sunlin One uh, performed reasonably well, although not great, with respect to the, the walkability score. Um, this shows you the environment. Um, fairly sparse here, I took this photograph before it was opened, actually, in 1996. We're all standing to attention, actually, to commemorate Deng Xiaoping's demise. And uh, it was, uh, it, 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 so, so that's why we don't see very many trees, except in a sort of small firm. As you'll see later on, it's quite verdant. Um, this community was largely for uh, a group in Luan, which is in central Shanghai, who were relocated into Boudon. And they, in fact, were part of this third, third, third uh, scheme with respect to um, the financing of the project. Um, a second one is Tongfangsheng, uh, which is similar. It's located, actually, in the historical uh, Pinjang block of Suzhou. You can see where the red circle is on, on this particular uh, image. Um, it was designed, actually, by the Beijing Design Institute uh, 3.6 hectare site, 210 dwelling units, so it's quite small. Uh, Suzhou city government were the developers. It's well serviced with respect to access to schools, transport. It is uh, a mega plot that kind of got subdivided into four bits. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the mega plot was uh, originally had a lot of dilapidated housing, which was pulled down in order to build uh, Tongfengshan. A wide range of unit types that go from you know, six or seven stories on the periphery, which is fairly classic, going back to the model of the Lilong and so forth in China. Um, it also had a program of historic conservation. There were a number of temples and um, civic halls uh, that were maintained and actually restored. Um, and then there was a scattering of, of, of other dwelling types all the way through to single family attached uh, units that were supposed to be um, uh, brought up by a lot of expatriates who were moving into Suzhou at the time. This is a general view of it, um, showing some of the housing, uh, which was fairly spacious. The cost was not great. It's about 18,000 Y per square metre. Um, uh, reasonable. And this shows, again, comparisons with respect to the environmental comfort you can sort of see one of these major roads on the side of these mega plots in red. Not a very good sign, rather uncomfortable. Um, and the walk score here was quite high insofar as it was very much an urban place in an urban uh, context and all that went with it. And this shows more what it's like today. It's very verdant. Lane environments predominate um, in the interior of the mega plot. Uh, it's quite a, actually quite a, nice, uh, quite a nice environment, actually. And indeed, it was very influential at the time it was built, or shortly thereafter, on a lot of development around it that sort of started to mimic within the megaplot arrangement uh, similar kinds of, of arrangements. One part of the survey we're involved in, you can sort of see me shaking hands with the motorbike gang from Sunlin One in the, in the top left, uh, was we, we interviewed households. Um, you can see that here. We also interviewed developers, we also in interviewed the management of people, and we also da gathered a lot of data and redrew and so forth um, on the sizes and shapes and costs and so forth of the actual uh, dwellings uh, and, and so on in these communities themselves. Um, this is a brief summary of some of the results, and the ones that I've highlighted in red are the ones that surprised me. I mean, I'm a bit slow in some ways, right? So living space, for example, it didn't matter where we were and what the socioeconomic status of the uh, respondent. Uh, everybody knew almost to the third decimal point the size of their unit, which was often quite small. Nobody complained, no matter what. 
and there was huge variation and so forth. So I was rather shocked by that. I thought that a general response was, well, it's too small, and da, and da, and so forth. No, niente. Another one was, one of the biggest uh, concerns for them was fresh food. And I went, huh? I mean, just go to the local market, right? I mean, you know, pull it out of the refrigerator. Well, as you all probably know, uh, refrigeration and food security in China is only about 70% there. So it's actually a big issue from a, um, uh, from a uh, health point of view. Uh, but I, I was unaware of that. The other thing that was consistent across the board is the amenity package. That is to say, of recreational facilities, of the, the kind of gardens and so forth of these communities was very, very well endowed. I mean, in comparison to you know, places I know of in the United States, extremely well endowed. Not only that, you have often the inclusion of community facilities just because of the way who was running the particular project within them as well. So they were three aspects that I found kind of interesting amongst the, the main findings of our um, rather lengthy study. This was conducted, by the way, in 2014-2015. Now, turning to this template that I speak of, which is the sort of underlying driving force from a statutory planning point of view for these uh, large megaplot developments, um, you, in this particular case, they, they, they can around about 400 metres by 400 metres, which ain't small, it means it's about 10 to 16 hectares at least in scale. They involve monotonic typological development. Here we have slab block, slab block, slab block. <laughs> um, and they're often enclosed, they're kind of sealed on the borders and to the outside world. These particular examples are actually from uh, Xi'an, uh, which is a city in the central north part of uh, China. Now, this arrangement usually comes by way of a master plan which says what the uses are, the colour scheme, so to speak, is drawn up. And then within the master plan for every single block is a controlled detail plan, which talks about the FAR, talks about the height, talks about the setbacks, talks about every possible thing you can think of. It's, it's a sort of a grandfathered kind of form zoning, we would call it in the United States, that, that is applied. On top of that, you have the harmonising of building regulations um, uh, within the confines of the controlled detail plan, often based on work in one or two cities. These happen to be Shanghai based, but extending beyond that. And so you end up with this kind of one size fits all regulatory system. One of the out outcomes of that is largely, by the way, this is an exercise I set students on the left hand side. I gave them the rules and regulations and said, go draw it. And this, on the right-hand side, is the real thing, okay? So you end up with what you define or script is actually what you get, with very, very little variation of that. And it sort of shows, I think, some of the, some of the problems um, uh, involved in this kind of um, method of, uh, shall we say, uh, development. Of course, it's administratively easy to do, so a lot of people do it. Developers love it because they've got lots of land and lots of stuff to operate with, right? But anyway, um, one of the big problems, of course, is this, traffic congestion. All of you probably know big, wide um, roads, even though they're very wide, and cars can go down them, et cetera, et cetera, um, without a, a finer grain network leads inevitably to huge pileups of cars, particularly as the car ownership rises, as it has been very quickly in China. Um, on the other hand, in some cities, and these are some examples from Kunming, you can also turn that around and create um, uh, BRT systems by uh, reducing the width of the roads and actually providing mechanisms for uh, infusing public transit into it, which, which is what they did in Kunming, for example, the Swiss, with Swiss help. Um, the potential or capacity for despecialization also goes down um, as you build megaplots up over time, you may say, what the heck do you mean by despecialization? I mean the capacity for the buildings to change use over time and even to be replaced over time. Think Greenwich Village. How many of you have ever been to Greenwich Village in New York? Very few. It's lovely. 
um, but it's a very varied kind of uh, environment. It's the one that Jane Jacobs spoke about, right, in talking about um, the need to get back to that. So think of despecialization as something that allows cities to avoid becoming obsolescent very quickly, right, because they can flex, they can move, they can accommodate growth and change in a much more easy way, and a lot of that's actually tied to the geometries and scales of the transport network. Thirdly, you have environmental footprints, which are huge. Um, in the top slides, um, I was for quite a while an advisor to the mayor of uh, Wuhan. Uh, he was a, actually he was a professor, Professor Zhang. Um, he was a historian and he, he, he worried about the kind of, what he referred to as the carpeting of his city across um, uh, an, a natural environment, as you can sort of see on the right hand side, which was replete with marshes and lakes and so forth, including the very, very beautiful East Lake, which I think is the equal of the West Lake that we know so well from Hangzhou. Um, we convinced him to declare a moratorium of any building around um, the, the, the East Lake, which he, he qu quickly did, but it illustrates a problem. On the other hand, to be fair-handed about this, sort of large, larger scale plots also allow you to do an awful, awful lot of on-site water harvesting, if you have a chance to do that, as well as water cleaning. Uh, and there's a project uh, here by Vanka, which I'll come to a little later on, in, on the bottom to illustrate that. Then another final problem with the megaplots is uh, a, a sense of isolation and lack of services, um, which is often very, very high, and the to social costs associated with that, long commutes, etc., cetera, um, uh, and being away from your family and home. These are images that are taken from the Huilongguang and Tiantongyuan uh, area of Beijing in the north in Chengping district. Uh, if you put these together, you're talking about probably 450,000 people. And they, sh they have schools, a few. They have schools, a few. They have shops, not very many, uh, for, for that size population. It's served by two subway lines, where people gang up a bit like you're arranged here in lines, and you have guys with um, hard hats who are retired with batons to keep you in line to get people on and off trains. It reminds me of the, the pushes and the signs in Japanese railroad trains, I remember, in, in, in the roaring 80s, where they said, please, we, please wear slippery clothing. And you have these guys pushing you into the cars. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so in, in the end, you end up with these plots. And I'm just showing these. This is to scale. This is comparing. Um, the couple of the projects you saw before with uh, counterparts in uh, uh, Barcelona, which has a 113 metre by 113 metre grid, and in New York City where you have the 260 metre uh, by 67 metre rectangular arrangement. Now, looking at beginnings of things in China these days, let's say the last four or five years, five years I suppose, given the gentleman on the top right, um, uh, and, and moving into, it's a sort of a turning point to my way of thinking in, in, in the sort of historical circumstances and where they themselves are even beginning to talk about the new normal and what does that actually mean. Well, it has lots of meanings. Largely it has to do with the fact that they're going to control GDP from way up there to something like six point something percent, which is not shabby, <laughs> but considerably further down than say 10 and 12 percent. They're also working against a population that is going to shrink pretty quickly. 2035, by most projections, China's population is going to go down and there ain't going to anything anyone can do about that now other than sort of massive in-migration, which seems to be uh, not, not at all uh, possible. The emphasis, again, is shifted very much from an idea of quantity, i.e. GDP growth, GDP growth, this sort of thing, into uh, an idea that it, it has to be quality. Um, with this constant building, when I say 43% of the housing is only 10 years old, they finally got to a point where they enter into the so-called stock age. Do you know what that is? How, when do you think a rental market occurs in, in cities? Hmm? When you've got sufficient houses to rent. You've got to build them first, right? And that occurred, and the way to measure it is you ask the question, in the transactions that occur within a particular setting, in this case China, 
Uh, at what point do, does the second hand market exceed the number of transactions in the primary market, that is to say the building market? In China that occurred briefly in 2005 and consistently from about 2009 onwards. So China is really only now at a point where, forget about you know, airy-fairy ideas we might have about the social efficacy of rental and the flexibility it, 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 it gives and, and the sort of comfort it, it supplies for young professionals going out in the world, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have the units, you can't do it. And China's now just sort of moving into that. And, it, and again, this is part of the new normal because it brings it much closer to more mature markets and so forth um, in other parts um, of, 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 of the world. And of course, now a huge push on the part of the middle class. Uh, gee whiz, we're sick of having respiratory diseases, et cetera, et cetera, and a pushback with respect to environmental quality. And um, a, a lot more serious attention being given uh, to, to that. Um, also part of this, of course, has been the massive buildup of capital asset investments, particularly in things like these, trains, high-speed trains. I'm um, showing you, the, this is a modelling of accessibility, a time cost map, if you like, from 1949 when the People's Republic started to one in 2020. And you can sort of see the impact that high-speed rail is going to have in terms of place and place dislocation and so forth in China is, is pretty, pretty massive. And of course, to do that has meant um, an awful lot of um, uh, infrastructure building and capital asset uh, investment. And of course, as I said, the pent-up demand for improved environmental quality is getting higher and higher at virtually at every, every level of, of, of government. And this is questions of resource use and, of course, carbon. Also residual, residual disposal of, um, of, 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 of productive uh, aspects and taking up with scarcities. Uh, for example, China is basically water scarce anywhere north of a, of a line that you might rule through Shanghai. Extremely uh, water scarce. And, uh, you know, so, so it goes on. Now, in the face of this and this new normal, uh, there are a number of uh, strategies and programs that are coming into, into effect. And I want to go through about three or four of these, and so, including some of the subclasses of them. And see, these are, these are all uh, pretty new. Number one is uh, pursuit of finer grained blocks and block structures. And uh, these are six or seven suggestions that were promulgated uh, in 2015 by the State Council. If you know anything about the way uh, China rules, you have the Politburo and a few guys up here, they're guys, not girls, by the way, and then you have the State Council, which sort of codifies everything. If it doesn't go through the State Council and there's votes on it, it doesn't really exist as a law. So this is the State Council speaking. Admittedly, the word they used was suggestions, but it's a bit like a guy holding a gun to your head and going, whispering, do this now, you know. So, the, an example of what they, they mean is this. This is um, a, one of the projects we looked at in our set. Uh, this is Chaosheng in Suzhou, and ways in which it could be opened up more. Yeah. Wait a minute. Way, 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 ways in which it could be opened up more. This is very enclosed. This was once a done way, uh, and everything about it's sort of fine inside, but it's like boxed in. Uh, if we go back to Sunlin one, being a little more heavy handed, there are various things that one could suggest to do. Then, in a case I, I was working on, uh, again with my. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say friend necessarily, but the party secretary of Kunming uh, was, uh, what do you do with these large Dunway blocks? This is a huge mega plot here in both examples, uh, where you had about 10 or 15 Dunways parked together in order to break it down and to make it into um, a, a, a more workable block. One of the sides of this thing was 750 metres long. You know, you, you, you'd run out of puff by the time you got halfway through it. And we devised a series of both vehicular accesses as well as pedestrian ones and so forth and a park scheme to go along with that. This is now becoming fairly commonplace, by the way. Now, the mechanics...
um, of fine-grained um, blocks are, are very apparent in the geometries and so forth. And let me run through that a bit. The geometry is often defined by intersections, the number of road uh, lines, the number of blocks that you can sort of subdivide something into, and of course, uh, as a function of the routes. In other words, how do you get quickly from A to B through a fine-grained um, uh, circumstance, like the bottom right? You can do that probably more easily, uh, or more alternatives, than certainly anything on the, the top line of this particular examples. You also end up with relationships such, such as these, which we, you work out mathematically, uh, where you look at intersections and intersection density, and then routes. And the curve on the, on the, on the right-hand side is quite instructive because it shows you you don't have to subdivise very much in order to improve considerably the network capacity to deal with traffic. So why don't you do it? You know, comes the rhetorical aspect of that. And of course, if we take a look at this in relationship, these are uh, on the top. You've got subdivisions of various kinds, and the and the very large scale uh, mega plot of uh, of China, and I might say also Korea, uh, 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 as well, and, and to some extent Taiwan. It's, it seems to be a sort of Asian thing, used to be a Russian thing, um, but you can sort of see that in comparison to the bottom uh, set of examples, which are the sort of classic grid sizes and scales of um, uh, counterparts uh, elsewhere in the, in, in the world. And I'm setting aside surveying areas like happened in Adelaide where it was like you know, twice the size it was supposed to be or something because somebody screwed up. Um, another set of, of planning uh, and urban design strategies, apart from fine-grained blocks, also focuses on the uh, fact that China is really bifold in its spatial distribution of urban settlement. It has large cities and it has smaller towns. Large uh, cities designated about 670. How many towns? 22,000. <laughs> but in, in population terms, they're almost parallel with one another. It's almost a 50-50 division. So this raises the question of um, we know what goes on in the big guys, but what about the little guys or the medium-sized guys, right? Maybe we ought to be paying a little bit of attention uh, to them. And so um, I'm talking here about strategies to bring local amenity down in scale to the tier three, tier four, tier five, and so on settlements in order to make uh, life more bearable and to also stem the migration into the, into the larger cities uh, as a sort of response to that. And there are at least three things I, uh, three, three parts uh, of this, or three programs that I think are interesting here. The first one is the sort of townization program, the Cheng Zhenhua uh, system, which uh, began uh, really under Li Keqiang, uh, and particularly in Jiangsu and in Zhejiang province, which were fairly, uh, um, fairly wealthy and so forth. And what they started to do was to systematically look at towns in um, these provincial settings in order to figure out which ones they should focus on in order to improve the amenity. Where, in other words, what's the risk? If I had to spend uh, $10 somewhere, where would I do that and get the best bang for the buck? Which is a fairly rational way to go about it, I suppose. Um, in the Jijiang case, this shows you the distribution of, of uh, uh, towns that were picked uh, in order to, to look at this a little bit more uh, carefully and to also look very particularly at their combination of community services, commercial activities, and lifestyle support, right? That three-part three uh, division of the so-called commerce box that we often think about. One of the findings um, was that towns under about 50,000 people really performed not very well with, the, with respect to adequate provision of basic services, garbage, sewage, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, why? Well, they were too small. And under the particular regimes and so forth in place, didn't have the financial capacities to deal with that. So what did they do? The town on the, on the, on the left is Guali, which is in uh, Zhejiang province. And what they did is they joined forces with some towns nearby in order to increase the scale 
and therefore increase the amount of income that could go into to, to instead of providing half a fire engine to have a full fire engine. The so-called pooling that is very common, for example, in Italy uh, for dealing with these service prob problems in a, in a country which is dominated essentially by relatively small uh, towns. I'm talking about the Italians. Now, part of this focus was also to um, begin to suggest uh, how community uh, and commercial and lifestyle services could be introduced into these communities. And one of them was to come up with this kind of uh, mall-like arrangement that could be placed close to the centre of towns and close to the administrative hubs. And one example of where that was done quite successfully is Dianco. Dianco is, uh, is, is in Zhejiang province. It's about 88,000 people, um, so it's above the sort of threshold, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, it's been fairly successful with respect to revitalising its industry, and in the middle of the left-hand left side of the opposite picture is this complex that they built to address itself to the combination of commercial, uh, community services and um, lifestyle activities. And they built the puppy, and it kind of looks a bit like this uh, in, in, in terms of it. It's sort of like a, a, a mall plus in a way, um, uh, and is very well used and very well attended as a, as a, as a kind of um, prototype for that. So that's townization, which is a, a policy that's um, operating uh, actually under the uh, Intergovernmental and Development Reform Commission, which is the, the group just underneath the State Council, which is responsible for harmonising the activities of the various ministries. Um, so again, it has a slightly different sponsorship, but it's, it's aimed at the same thing, it's aimed at uh, this, this improvement of the life uh, in the tier three, four, five. Another example, which is a little more perhaps esoteric in a way, is the Tissa uh, Xiaoxin um, uh, specialty towns. Um, this is the brainchild of uh, Li Cheng, who's now the party secretary of, of Shanghai, when he was the governor of Zhejiang province. You might also point out he was also the secretary of uh, Xi Jinping when he was <laughs> party secretary of Zhejiang province. So it's sort of in the bloodstream, you might say. And the idea here is that you go into a, 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 an area where you find um, an old industrial site, uh, in this case uh, sort of shown in the series of maps, and you modify it uh, as, a, as a kind of um, uh, uh, seeding of a program of, of uh, reindustrialization, of attracting talent and so forth, and then it sort of spreads out from that. It's a kind of a metastasizing strategy, if, if, if you think about it, to promote uh, local circumstances, to upgrade industrial sites, to provide lifestyle services, particularly towards knowledge and industries in this, in this particular case, and startups and so forth. This is a program that began in around about 2015. And one example that um, is sort of promising that I'm fairly familiar with is this one, uh, Mengxiang. It's in Hangzhou. Uh, it means, of course, dream town. But, you know, setting that aside, <laughs> um, it, it, it was, it's in a long, skinny piece of land that was an old industrial site by a canal uh, where the, the, the environment was considerably upgraded to host startups, not only just in IT, but also in the sort of artisanal aspect of production manufacturing and industrial design and all that sort of thing, bringing design to market. Uh, was one of the things that they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty good at. Um, this image shows some of the circumstances of Mengxiang, um, and the object was to, to add, of course, a heightened local uh, sense to the place and to its urban character, and to develop in that localised urban character as much as possible. I must admit, some of these specialty towns have become very kitschy. There's one called Dogtown, which is shaped like a dog's bone. I mean, gee whiz. And then you have Chocolate Town, and, uh, and so, so it goes on. But uh, by and large, it's a bit, little bit more serious uh, a proposal, I think. This is starting with uh, Mengxiang, showing a range of building types, which um, varied from historic uh, conservation all the way through to quite new radical pieces, like on the top right, uh, which is a library uh, complex, and then other kinds of uh, office uh, commercial as well as uh, retail and a startup commercial on the bottom right. Uh, 
Then a third program of this kind are in fact the creative districts. And in this case, I'm going to be talking about Shanghai, but they also exist elsewhere in, in, in China. In fact, the, 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 um, probably the poster child of this would be 798 in, in Beijing in a way. Um, and the program here is to uh, try to shift development very much towards private capital and private development by allowing mixes of market rate development to occur also in conjunction with conservation of uh, properties uh, and so on. This began in 2006, about the same time that Shanghai came up with its historic conservation plan, uh, which is a, is, a, is, a, is a fairly ambitious and a pretty good one, I must say. Um, and also to mix the sort of conservation activities, by the way, going back to this, uh, you might say, what on earth is all this red? It's sort of showing you, um, uh, 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 this is an area in Hongqiao where there's quite a lot of Lelong housing that's vulnerable. Uh, there, there are a few industrial buildings that are vulnerable, old apartment buildings from the 30s, from the high pie period of, of Shanghai that are vulnerable. And this is one of the outcomes, which is the, the Detlin apartment complex, which was quite famous, actually, from a historical point of view. You can sort of see it in its original guise on the top left. And then over time, it got a bit run down on the right. And then and later on in this program, it got combined with other uses around it in order to uh, bring it back to life, but also to invigorate that particular part of, of Shanghai, and in a way that's for sort of very local to it, and very local to it in historical uh, terms as well. Other probably more well-known examples are M50 um, on the left, which was an old factory for steel, light engineering, that now hosts something like 120 galleries and performance spaces. Some of you may have bought art there. Um, it, it's, it's a, a major art uh, uh, outlet. And on the right, the Shanghai Sculpture Space, which is a slightly wacky park with a bunch of buildings uh, in repurposed industrial space uh, for uh, artisans and sculptors and so forth to work. Red Town's another one. There are something like 70 of these, by the way, spread out, these so-called designated creative districts throughout uh, the Shanghai metropolitan area. Another one is this, Bridge 8, which was um, <laughs> an old automobile, body shops and things like that, which got rehabbed uh, into uh, studios uh, and support facilities for lifestyle services and so forth within Shanghai. Now, a third aspect of this new normal and the strategies that flow from that is, of course, sponge city. Right? Uh, a curious term, um, allegedly coined by one of our graduates, a guy called Yu Kong Jung. Um, I think that's probably right. I know him very well. Uh, uh, the idea of trying to create um, in landscape environments which are somewhat mimetic of natural processes and particularly given the scarcity of water and so forth in uh, China to use them specifically for harvesting, water harvesting and containing water, becoming detention and, and retention sites. By the way, half of these cities, I'm talking about the 670, are water scarce. They don't have enough water. Beijing is, of course, one of them. Um, this is a scheme he did for the expo in um, uh, Shanghai. It's the Hutan um, Park, Turinscape's the name of the firm, uh, and the idea here was also to capture overland flow into the river, the Huangpu, and to clean it uh, as well as hold it um, on site. It was more of a demonstration of that. It's not as if Shanghai is, shall we say, water scarce, far from it. If anything, it suffers from floods. Um, Sponge City uh, also. Uh, is involved with these kind of simulations of naturalistic circumstances. The project on the right is one that's being uh, looked at very carefully for Songjiang, which is a, a district in the southwest of uh, Shanghai, uh, uh, in order to also deal with the question of flooding. By the way, 230 of these 670 cities in China also flood rather regularly and rather badly. So you've got half of them without water and the other ones with, a, shall we say, a superabundance of water. And the, the goal of this sort of program is by 2020 to have something like 80% of the urban areas um, uh, 
containing about 70% of the rainfall that falls there. Right? That's a pretty high ask, although probably not impossible to achieve. At a more kind of project level, you have examples like this. This is Langun Gardens by Vanke uh, in Shanghai, in the western part of Shanghai, where uh, there's a combination of, as you can sort of see on the top right, uh, water harvesting, cleaning, uh, conservation ac activities of various kinds built into the infrastructure of uh, the development uh, itself. And here are some further views of that um, and the variety of housing uh, types that one finds also in Lundgren Gardens and the kind of site conditions uh, in this rather exemplary project with respect to its environmental uh, footprint. At larger scales, we have projects like this, which is the Mengqing Yuan um, Park slash flood control slash water treatment plant on Suzhou Creek, which was always referred to in the 1930s as that fetid creek, uh, you know, stank, <laughs> among other things. Uh, it's a dense urban area, and this has on-site water storage. It's a joint use project, by the way, particularly joint use between the environmental remediation that it's doing as well as the recreational opportunities it offers with respect to its uh, park uh, setting. And it is a sort of sponge city project, almost literally insofar as it soaks everything up, holds it, cleans it, and also is a, is a site for recreational activity. So in summary then, um, for sure the redesign of megaplots has been um, widening and continuing um, and getting away from the very highly enclosed megaplot arrangements. But it's also a balancing act because one of the also, um, and this, this, these illustrations I think illustrate that, one of, the, one of the benefits of these larger plots is you do end up with these rather serene, highly vegetated uh, sorts of areas with a high degree of security, which by the way, the people who live there like. And not only that, the people who live next door in a similar situation also like um, a different sort of so social attitude. So uh, as I'm constantly warning people in China, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, it's, it's a question of finding a balance between you know, size, scale and enclosure and also uh, some of the attributes that are positive about the old approach. I, I'm, I'm not saying that it should exist, the old approach, uh, but uh, I think one needs to be careful. Um, also, you have this uh, tendency towards localization that I mentioned in the programs that do this, which I think is, is, uh, is, is an extremely good thing, again, given the varied culture that exists within, within China. Um, and, uh, and the idea of you know, these rituals of place, if you like, these are taken from various parts of the world, but clearly the one on the right-hand side is very much of a Chinese uh, uh, kind. And a lot of these sort of settings are almost ready-made in the tier three, four, and five the communities that I've been talking about earlier. A third uh, aspect, I think, has got to do with the so-called third way that China seems to be charting in its mega-regional areas. By that I mean the Bohai, Bohai Bay, Yellow River area in the north with, with uh, Tianjin and Beijing, the Changjiang Delta in the middle, that's the one I'm showing here in this particular image, as well as the uh, Pearl River Delta uh, towards the south. Um, by the way, the Changjiang Delta has a population of something like 80 million, so it's sort of like parking Germany there, right? Just to give you an idea of scale. And the third way has got to do with finding ways of stopping the acceleration of megacities on the one hand, and also getting away from the kind of backward idea of everybody staying in these small towns and controlling them by virtue of hukku or some other uh, household registration or control system to stay at home, but to find a way in which large, medium size and small can cohabit in networks that are self-supporting and have benefits with respect to the social costs and social opportunities as well as the environmental footprints. And what you're seeing here is we, we do a lot of modeling in my lab of this sort of thing computationally to figure out where communities ought to be, kind of how they ought to be arranged and so forth and so on. Uh, and this was a sort of a summary of one of the studies we made of the Changjiang, which certainly 
illustrates the point of large, medium size and small, please. Not all big or not all small or just simply big and small. And of course, sponge city concepts also have merit, uh, particularly if we broaden the definition away from the sponge city into the one of, say, low impact development, as is practiced in the US to some extent and in Europe to be sure, um, where it imitates natural processes, not just the sort of absorptive character of things. If any of you know anything about the way in which unit hydrographs work in flood conditions, there are times when you want to get the stuff away as far as possible, in which case concrete channels are pretty good. And there are other places where you want to hold it on the uh, as well, where sponges are very good. And finally, at this um, middle stage, I might say, of China's urban development, because that's where I think we are, frankly. Um, I think the trends that are in place now under this new normal are quite encouraging, the localism, the environmental footprint, and so on, uh, and should be encouraging to any of you in the audience who are students and want to go back and practice there, frankly. Uh, it's a different sort of climate, and uh, a lot of the stuff you learn here will probably be put to good use fairly quickly. But I might point out that what China's been doing is um, uh, something it's been doing for a long time. The gentleman on the top left is, of course, Dong Xiaoping, who famously said, I don't care what colour cats are as long as they catch rats. And we're going to cross the river by feeling the stones. In other words, advocating an incremental, multi-pronged approach mm -hmm to problems of a social as well as an environmental kind, which I believe is going on now in China. What finally becomes of it, I'm not exactly sure, but I think I, I feel fairly optimistic about it, and quite frankly, we will see, and probably see fairly quickly. Okay, Xie thank you very much for your attention.